listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to look at the advent of frequency neuroweapons. Now, we've talked a little bit about this kind of thing before in the guise of electronic mind control technologies. But these things have been weaponized in many different ways, as we have seen in recent years, with things that happened at various embassies around the world. How the claim was made that it was some kind of an electronic weapon, a frequency neuro weapon of sorts. You may be surprised to discover just how old some of these technologies are. We've talked before about the methodologies of mind control and human manipulation and things like this and all of the tried and true techniques that were learned through the secret society groups and have been applied in the modern day by the intelligence agencies. But you might be surprised to actually find out that these electronic type weapons or radio frequency weapons that have been used in this way are far older than what you might think. So tonight we're going to explore this topic in a little bit more depth as we read into a book by the late great Jim Keith called Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness, and Mr. Keith put together quite the compilation of resources and study here into this volume. Now this is one of his lesser known books. He's more well known for his Mind Control, World Control book. But this one is a real gem. And I actually have a physical copy of this that I'll be reading from here tonight. My preferred method of collecting important books is to get the actual physical hard copy of a book whenever possible. Because that way, you know, nobody's messing with it online. They can't change some of the text in and out of there. So this is a preferred method for me for finding good valuable information because a time is coming folks where you won't be able to trust anything that you find online anymore we're rapidly approaching that with the advent of chat gpt and these artificial intelligence engines running things they can just go in and arbitrarily change change the words around in a document and you would be none the wiser I suspect that may be coming, and that's probably why the controlling powers and factors in this world have been trying to digitize everything, all these old books, into the computer. So at some future point, they could change it at the touch of a button, and they might not even need to touch a button. Perhaps their algorithms and their computer programs, their artificial intelligence, will do so for them as we've seen in recent months here with the things that are being done with these AI chatbots and this GPT, all of these things, this chat GPT, all of these tif different types of AI programs, they've been actually just making stuff up out of whole cloth without any real validation, just based upon some of the things they see. So it's becoming where it's going to be very difficult to parse out what's true and what's false with online records anymore. So books, hard copy books, still the best solution for these things. And I wish I had more space to actually keep more hard copy books. Sadly enough, most of my library is a digital library. I do have a pretty good size collection of physical books as well. But it pales in comparison to the digital library I've accumulated. And I try my best to keep those files secured and protected because I don't want them tampered with. But the time is coming in the future where it'll be very difficult to find anything of real value on the internet. So it's important that we archive this stuff as best we can now and maybe put things on the record before it becomes so muddled that you won't be able to discern good information from false information. So I wanted to get into this because that's the other aspect here, is these neuroweapons, these frequency-based neuroweapons, technology-based mind control technologies are far older than you think. And we're going to get a little bit into the history of that now. 
So without further ado, I'm going to read from Jim Keats' book, as I pointed out here, about electronic mind control. A giant leap forward in the technical capability for mind control came with the discovery that electromagnetic energy could be used to influence, disable, or kill humans at a distance. The famous scientist Nikola Tesla was one of the first persons to delve into the effects of electromagnetics on the human organism, with E.L. Chaffee and R.U. Light following in 1934 with the monograph A Method for the Remote Control of Electrical Stimulation of the Nervous System. going to pause for a moment here, folks. 1934. There's an official date for you for one of the first mind control technologies. One of the first. And of course, this is quoting Tesla here as well. In the same year, Soviet scientist Leonid L. Vizilov wrote critical evaluation of the hypogenic method about the discoveries of Dr. I. F. Tomaszewski and his research into remote influencing of the brain through radio waves. Vasilev wrote, quote, As a control of the subject's condition when she was outside the laboratory in another set of experiments, a radio setup was used. Not many experiments of this sort were carried out, but the results obtained indicate that the method of using radio signals substantially enhances the experimental possibilities, end quote. Later in the paper, Vasilev wrote, quote, Tomaszewski, I.F. Tomaszewski, famed Russian physiologist, carried out the first experiment with this subject at a distance of one or two rooms, and under conditions where the participant would not know or suspect that she would be experimented with. In other cases, the sender was not in the same house and someone else observed the subject's behavior. Subsequent experiments at considerable distances were successful. One such experiment was carried out in, in a part at a distance. Mental suggestion to go to sleep was complied with within a minute. End quote. Gonna pause right there for a moment again. 1934, folks, they were able to induce sleep at a distance with strictly electronic means using radio frequency. 1934. I told you this is probably far older than you think it is. Let's read on here. Another researcher into the potential of electromagnetics in the 1930s was Professor E. Casamali. Casamali bombarded subjects with VHF radio waves and told an astounded world that his subjects would hallucinate when under the influence of his oscillatoria telegraphica. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. Hallucinations. He was able to use VHF frequency waves to induce hallucinations in people. Once again, the 1930s. So keep this in mind as we progress on here and think about how, how much further down the road these technologies are today. Andriha Puharik was another early researcher into the effects of electromagnetics who delved into the effects of radio waves on animals, working at Northwestern University in the late 1940s. Puharik founded a laboratory he called the Round Table Foundation of Electrobiology in what he modestly termed a barn in the woods outside of Camden, Maine in 1948. It was hardly a barn, sized 100 by 50 feet, with a basement and upper story. It had been used by the Navy, reportedly for storage during World War II. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Notice he named... This laboratory, the Round Table Foundation of Electrobiology. Gee, I wonder where he got that name from. Probably from a guy named Rhodes. <laughs> but that's just another story for another time. But let's continue on here. Among Puharik's associates at the Round Table were Warren S. McCulloch, one of the founders of Cybernetics Theory, who had worked at Bellevue Hospital in New York. 
McCulloch was an early advocate of electronic brain implants and chaired conferences sponsored by the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, a channel for CIA mind control funding. Another associate of Paharik's was John Hayes Hammond, said to have been Nikola Tesla's only student. Hayes was also interested in the use of electromagnetics to influence the human mind. Going to pause for a moment again here, folks. The Macy Foundation, hugely important here, a massively influential foundation, sending monies around to various projects here. This was the group that funded and hosted the Cybernetics Group and the Foundation of Cybernetics in the Modern Era as the science that is used for these sort of things. You see, cybernetics is simply the science of whole systems control. That's what it is. It's not all about robotics and this kind of thing, artificial intelligence. It's simply the science of systems control. And that's the important aspect of this to keep in mind because you could talk about any system. You could apply this to any system. It does not have to be a machine. A robot, a computer, could be biology, the human mind, even whole economies. Whole economies manipulated through cybernetics methodologies. That's what these people were all about. And you could see how applying these methodologies to the use of electronic weapons that can directly affect human behavior, well, you could see how it could be used for something Kind of nefarious. So let's continue on here. After the demise of Puharik's round table, he spent time with social engineer Aldous Huxley in Tecate, Mexico, again studying the effects of electronics on the human organism. Puharik was also employed at the Army's Chemical and Biological Warfare Center at Fort Detrick, Maryland. No kidding researching the effects of LSD for the CIA in 1954. He delved into the effects of dig digitoid drugs at the Permanente Research Foundation with funding from the Sandoz Chemical Works. Among Puharik's accomplishment was the design of what is described as a radio tooth implant... A radio tooth implant, the technical specs of which were sold to the CIA. At a conference on electromagnetism in September of 1987, Puharik described this invention. He said, quote, We were able to develop a hearing device that fit under the cap of a tooth, and we could hear very clearly from a small little relay and receiver and transmitter, and unfortunately it was promptly classified by an agency of our own government. But what did solve the problem in terms of hardware? Sorry, but we did solve the problem in terms of hardware, end quote. The radio tooth implant may still be in use. Gonna pause for a second right there. That's as of the time of this writing, which was sometime in the 1990s. So I doubt very highly that it's still in use. I think they have more sophisticated things now. They don't need a tooth implant of that sort. But let's read on. According to the Chemical and Engineering News for February 5th, 1996, in a story titled, Hong Kong Professor Sues U.S. for Mind Control, the South China Morning Post reported on January 25th that an assistant professor at the University of Science and Technology, Hong Kong, has filed a $100 million suit against the U.S. government for implanting mind control devices in his teeth. Huang C. Ming charges that the devices were implanted during root canal work in 1991 while he was studying at the University of Iowa, according to Morning Post reporter Patricia Young. Another student at Iowa University, who, like Huang, was born in China, had gone on a shooting spree in the feds, Huang says, put the devices in his teeth to find out if he was involved. The Hong Kong professor says he suffered an Alzheimer's disease-like memory loss that hampered his teaching. It stopped, he says, only when he sought legal aid to mount his lawsuit. 
Besides the U.S., the suit names the University of Science and Technology on the grounds that it was involved in continuing the mind control work. It also seeks punitive damages of $1 million from the defendants for low ethical standards. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So we have people making claims that the intelligence agencies used these very things to spy on them and to see if they were involved in some other some other event that happened. That's what the claim is here. Now, th these are real technologies, okay? So this is definitely something that did exist at one time. Probably some portion or iteration of it still exists at this time. I think it's a lot more sophisticated than a tooth implant. But at that point, in 1991, that was probably a pretty easy thing for them to pull off. So, that being the case... You have to wonder, was there something to this guy's claim? Let's read on. Huang claims that one of the devices in his teeth can read his thoughts and talk to his mind when he's asleep. A second device, he believes, transmits pictures of what he sees to a receiver for recording. The mind controller, he says, can drive him to bad behavior. He gives two examples, one of which cannot be mentioned in a family magazine. Ho Wang is not alone in his complaints about having mind control devices implanted in his teeth. David B. recounts his story. He says, quote, X-rays revealed a metal object on the left side of my skull under the jaw in the soft tissue of my neck. In May 1996, I finally had it removed. I asked many doctors about the possibility of it falling there during an extraction. They said possible but remote. Most of them thought it punctured my neck from outside. I sent x-rays to Dr. Sims, and he arranged removal. The strange thing that came out of this was the discovery of the small object in my shoulder. Dr. Lear called after receiving my x-rays and asked if I had ever broken my shoulder. If I had ever been in an explosion, I replied no. He said the reason was that the x-ray clearly showed a screw in my left shoulder. He said it looked like an operation for a broken shoulder. I have never broken a bone to my knowledge and called my mother to ask. She said I'd had no operations as a child. This part is a complete mystery. During the first six months of torture, extreme at the time, I went to a dentist and reported pain under my new dental bridge installed a few months before the assault. He removed it, and I was still in contact. So I wrote off my teeth and concentrated on my throat wrongly. In my x-rays and CAT scan, one tooth is very bright, and in one frame of the CAT scan, it shows rays of white emanating from it. People, I asked, said it was probably an interference effect with the metal. End quote. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So some of these stories, even though... Even though they may seem a little outlandish, there might be something to these. Now, we see that they had an actual tooth implant transmitter. Who knows what else it was able to do? This We're talking, this goes back to, well, this was saying 1987 when this was admitted in an interview. Probably the 1960s is when they came up with that. Maybe even the 50s. So they had these these receiver transmitters that they could place inside what looked like a dental implant. And they could make this thing operate and record the frequencies. And now these people claim that it was even able to read their thoughts or put thoughts in their head, make them behave badly. Is there something to this? Well, let's read on and see what else we can figure out here. An insight into the state of early Soviet research into electromagnetics is provided by an account of a meeting held on May 22, 1963, in the office of Professor Zinoviev at the Ministry of Higher and Secondary Specialized Education in the Soviet Union. In a meeting of 16 scientists, a Professor Artemov mentioned what he called a, quote, mental work machine, end quote, 
Artemov said that in the near future, an electromagnetic broadcasting unit the size of a transistor radio would be used to stimulate creativity and mental energy. Artemov said that the first models of the machine that had been constructed were desktop size, but that now the units were portable and were in use. going to pause for a moment here, folks. So this is 1963. It is claimed by the Russian scientists here that they had a device the size of a transistor radio that could influence human thoughts in many different ways. Let's read on. The Soviets also worked on less benign applications of electromagnetics. About 1960, as microwave scientist Milton Zaret recalls it, he was approached by the CIA. Zaret had worked on an Air Force project evaluating potential eye damage to radar and microwave technicians, but the CIA was interested in more arcane matters. They asked about the effective the effect of microwaves on human behavior, and the possibility of using microwaves for brainwashing. Later, in 1965, they finally disclosed to Zeret why they were interested. The U.S. Embassy in Moscow was being bombarded with microwaves by the Soviets with radiation they dubbed the Moscow Signal. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. And this Moscow Signal was also called the Russian Woodpecker. Because this signal was being monitored by the U.S. intelligence agencies. Clear over in the U.S., they were able to hear this sound coming through from there. And they dubbed it the woodpecker because it was a very repetitive noise. This is a, a well-known historical record within the auspices of the intelligence community. And anybody that has actually researched this. So this Moscow signal, or the Russian woodpecker, a very real phenomenon, and it was related to some of these electromagnetic frequency experiments that were later connected to brainwashing. Brainwashing by the KGB, among others. Let's read on here. Zeret was briefed on Project Pandora, a government program in progress that was aimed at finding out why the Soviets were irradiating the embassy and perhaps turning that research to the CIA's own purposes. In one Project Pandora experiment, chimpanzees were irradiated with microwave bursts. The head of the program determined that, quote, the potential for exerting a degree of control on human behavior by low-level microwave radiation seems to exist, and he urged that the effects of microwaves be studied for possible weapons applications, end quote. Zaret conducted his own tests and determined that, whatever other reasons the Russians may have had, they believed the beam would modify the behavior of the personnel. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Doesn't this sound like the very same thing that happened just a, a short while ago, a couple of years back now, I believe it was, at another U.S. embassy? Nearer by, I think it was an embassy in Cuba, if I'm not mistaken, if memory serves me. But this was a big thing that has now been accepted in the mainstream news, where they were speculating that perhaps some type of frequency weapon was used on these ambassadors. Not so far-fetched anymore. Now, when Jim Keith was writing about this stuff back in the 1990s, people thought he was an absolute nutter. That all this was tinfoil hat conspiracy theory stuff. Well, got news for you, folks. It's not a theory. These are proven sciences now. They've been around a long time. This stuff has come out. It's come out very heavily into the public view. You see, they're not hiding things anymore. They used to hide things because they didn't want the public to find out about them. Now they don't care if the public finds out about them because... Well, let's face it, the public is so indifferent to everything now that they literally said, meh, peh, who cares, when the U.S. government admitted in the congressional record that aliens exist. <laughs> I'm not kidding. 
<laughs> so uh, th this is, it, it's unbelievable how far the human mind has fallen, and perhaps some of that is due to the use of these types of electronic weapons or radio frequency weapons that have been implemented against the human mind. People just don't care anymore. Doesn't matter how outrageous it is or how, how outrageous it sounds, they don't care. They don't believe it. They only halfway believe it. And even if they do, they feel as if, well, there's nothing I could do about it anyway. So they go about their business and ignore the potentials that could be achieved with such a thing, especially in the wrong hands. And they don't think twice about it. And they don't care. So we have this pall of indifference over us. That's very much descriptive of the modern era. It's a sad state of affairs. They've gotten to the point with this stuff now where they just don't care what comes out in the open because they know people are either going to not believe it or not do anything about it, one or the other or both. And then we wind up with situations like this. So now, just a couple of years ago, now it's readily out there, open to the public, public discourse out there, that these mind control weapons, electronic mind control weapons, that they do exist. And then it's very likely that's what happened to those people in that embassy just a few years ago. And this is talking about way back in the 1960s in Russia, in Moscow. Same type of thing occurred in the 1960s. That's how old these technologies are. That's how long they've been doing this stuff for. And they've only since been able to perfect the art of this all the more. So keep that in mind, and let's read on here. Zaret's recommendations were simple. The American government should demand that the Soviets stop irradiating its employees. Persons stationed at the embassy should be also be briefed on what was going on, which they had not been, and be given the option of transferring to other areas of the world. Zaret was assured that his suggestions would be followed, but they were in only one particular. President Lyndon B. Johnson issued a demand to the Soviets that the irradiation end. They ignored him. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So Johnson said, oh, you guys are, you're, you're being bad. Stop irradiating the people. And they're like, meh. And they ignored him, and he didn't do anything about it. So... They continued their programs, and of course, Johnson probably only half-heartedly said something because he knows the importance of this research. He knew the importance of this research, and of course, the U.S. was doing this t kind of thing themselves. So this wasn't just something the Russians were doing. It happens all throughout the world. All the nations of the world, all the militaries and intelligence agencies, they all have their hands into these types of technologies and techniques. They want to know how to control the people, and they have a pretty good grasp on how to do it. They know some of the old tried-and-true techniques, and they have access to some of the latest and most innovative technologies to do so. So, of course, they do it. Of course, they use this. Let's read on here and see what else happened here. Embassy personnel were never told that they were being subjected to electromagnetic irradiation, nor that tests showed many of them were afflicted with terrible medical problems. Ambassador Walter J. Stossel had problems with bleeding from the eyes and was diagnosed with a blood disease similar to leukemia. The two previous ambassadors had both died of cancer. State Department tests also found what they described as a slightly higher white blood cell count in one-third of the employees tested, but in fact their lymphocyte count was 40% higher than normal. Several children of embassy employees were found to have blood disorders. They would only learn of the source of their illnesses in 1972, when newspaper columnist Jack Anderson would blow the whistle on the Moscow signal in his newspaper column. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So the government knew and did nothing. It took a reporter 
a journalist to do the footwork and figure it all out. Now, was this a setup? I don't know. Or was this truly one of the last of the good journalists? The ones that actually investigated things rather than reading a prompt from a newswire service? I don't know. I don't think there's very much actual journalism going on anymore. That's why programs like this exist. That's why shows like this exist. That's why I do the things I do. Because there's people out there that don't bother to investigate anything anymore. They just read off a teleprompter and tell you what they're told to say. And that's all you get. And if you question that, well, they have 40,000 different fact checkers out there hitting you with a counter narrative to what you're saying to reinforce the mainstream narrative of everything. And it's getting trickier and trickier to navigate the landscape here. It's getting harder and harder to come across good information. So when we have good information and we have these historical contexts that we could look at to understand a few things about the modern era, about the state of the technologies and the techniques that they do have in manipulating human behavior, it's important that we keep all that stuff fresh in our mind. It's important to go back and look at the old stuff, the older writings, the older information. I think the closer you get to source with a lot of this, the better off you are. And that's the thing. We're so far removed in the modern era from a lot of the historical context of this. Where did it come from? Who started the development of these things first? Who used them for what early on? We're so far removed from that that we've become jaded to all of it. And I think it's important that we go back, we look at the history of these types of advents and trace them forward and we can see where we're at today and understand just how we've been manipulated and for how long we've been manipulated in many ways. So here we go. So we have here this columnist, Jack Anderson, blew the whistle on this Moscow signal in his newspaper column. So let's read about the fallout of that and we'll see what happened here. Because if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So let's see what happened here with Mr. Anderson and the response to this story. A possible byproduct of po Project Pandora is that in 1961, Dr. Alan Fry reported that microwaves are sometimes audible to humans, although the discovery was dismissed by many scientists as being a case of outside noise. Fry's experiment was later described in detail by James C. Lynn in his Microwave Auditory Effects and Applications. Fry found that human subjects exposed to 1,310 mega, er, megahertz and 2,982 megahertz microwaves at average power densities of 0.4 to 2 milliwatts per, cubic, er, per square centimeter perceived auditory sensations described as buzzing or knocking sounds. The peak power densities were on the order of 200 to 300 mic microwatts per square centimeter, and the pulse repetition frequencies varied from 200 to 400 hertz. Fry referred to the auditory phenomenon as the RF or radio frequency sound. The sensation occurred instantaneously at a at average incident power densities well below that necessary for known biological damage and appeared to originate from within or near the back of the head. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So this here is a precursor technology for what they call synthetic telepathy. Synthetic telepathy, which is absolutely a real thing. They've had it since at least the early 1970s. And they've, they're able to project sounds directly into the human head and bypass the ears. And this, on an unsuspe unsuspecting su subject, could make people think that perhaps they're hearing voices, hallucinating, they're going crazy. 
This weapon system has been used in the past against many people. So we see here, this is part of the whole Moscow Signal Project Pandora thing. And we'll see how we connect the dots here in a few minutes with all of this. Let's go ahead and read on here. There were important ramifications to Fry's discovery. In his paper, Human Auditory System Response to Modulated Electromagnetic Energy, Fry explained how voices can be beamed directly into an individual's head. Among other areas of research, Fry also delved into the induction of heart seizures by beamed electromagnetics. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. Your heart you can be induced to have a stroke or a heart attack or some such thing, a seizure of your heart with a frequency weapon. Keep that in mind. This was known in 1972, probably before that even. But that's about the timing of this Dr. Fry's research. Let's continue on. Other Pandora personnel included Operation Paperclip Nazis like Dr. Dietrich Beischer, who irradiated 7,000 Navy crewmen with dangerous levels of radiation at the Naval Aerospace Research Laboratory in Pensacola, Florida. Beischer simply disappeared in 1977 with records of his employment and his existence expunged. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. That's right. Former Nazis came here, committed atrocities... And they disappeared quietly into the background, into retirement, after they continued the research here. And nobody bats an eyelash. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Let's read on, because we're going to find out more, because this Project Pandora was pretty extensive. And all of this came about, remember, only because this columnist, Jack Anderson, did a little bit of digging and groundwork. Otherwise, we wouldn't know about this. Let's continue reading. Spanish researchers maintain that brain implant specialist Dr. Jose Delgado was also involved in Pandora. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. I did a program not all that long ago, several months back now, about Dr. Delgado. Interesting stuff he was involved with. But that's a side note if you want to go back and check that one out. That's very similar in scope and depth here, as far as covering the electronic mind control technologies. Let's continue, though. In 1972, the Department of the Army released a report titled Controlled Offensive Behavior, USSR, documenting 500 Russian studies of the use of super-high-frequency electromagnetic oscillations. SHF may be used as a technique for altering human behavior, the report stated. Lethal and non-lethal effects have been shown to exist. In certain non-lethal exposures, definite behavioral changes have occurred. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So super high frequency. Super high frequency electromagnetic oscillations. They can be used in lethal and non-lethal applications. Think about that. And they could most definitely alter your behavior. 1972, they were talking about this. Here we are, 51 years later. What do they have now? What have they developed with this now? Let's continue on here. In the same year, the U.S. Army Mobility Equipment Research and Development Center released a study titled Analysis of Microwaves for Barrier Warfare. The report discussed the use of truck-portable microwave broadcasting systems that would be used to irradiate and immobilize people and suggested that with the current state of armament, there was no way of protecting against the use of such a system. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Sounds like the later active denial system, doesn't it? You know, that one that 5G frequencies are built to emulate that uses millimeter waves, the active denial system. Uses millimeter waves in this way. This was an application that came about from this earlier application 
talking about putting one of these microwave weapons on a truck and being able to use it to immobilize people. Very much the same technology. 1972. 1972, the active denial system was not acknowledged as an actual thing until sometime in the 1990s. Even then, it wasn't acknowledged at that time, but now it's acknowledged as having originated sometime in the 90s. But I'm here to tell you, 20 years prior, there it is, right here, in the historical record, when you go back and you look at these developments. And that's why I always tell people, the things that we see out in the public view, things we see in the public view is the state of the art. Well, these are very, very old technologies. They've already been run through their paces by the military industrial complex, probably somewhere between 30 and 50 years prior. So anything you see that is the latest technology right now is probably bare minimum 30 years old. It's already been tested 30 years ago by the military industrial complex, weaponized in every possible way before released for public consumption for other usages. This is called dual use technology. This is the system upon which the framework on which government programs operate, advancing these technologies. This is what agencies like DARPA do. They'll fund various of these things. They'll develop them in secret in black programs for a long time, special access programs, through various corporations that contract with these government agencies. They develop and weaponize these technologies and test them covertly under the auspices of special access programs. And then later on, once they've found every possible militaristic use of it, they'll release it for public consumption and let the consumers and the world decide how to use it as a technology. And that usually happens after about 20 to 30 years, bare minimum, before we get these things acknowledged in the public. So 5G, that's based on this. That's the public use. Understand it's a dual-use technology. What was the intended use, the weaponized use? Well, to immobilize people. They don't need a truck anymore. They have a lot of the 5G infrastructure in place. All it would take is to pulse a certain frequency band through that 5G and everybody within range of it their behaviors can be altered to whatever state that these people want, whoever's controlling it wants. It's a type of active denial system. It could be used to immobilize you. All it takes is oscillating it at the right frequency. That's it. So let's continue on. I think I've gone through enough of a aside about that. But you have to think about these things because this is how we got where we are today. And now they've figured out how can we make this usable in some commercial way for the public where they'll accept this. And of course, I could stream movies ultra fast now. So that's why this infrastructure is in place. Well, I got news for you folks. It's a dual use technology. That might be useful for certain things for public sector things like that, but there's always these backdoor programs built into them. They can use it for a militaristic use at the flip of a switch. And it's there, the infrastructure's in place. But enough of my side tangent, let's get back to the reading here. So it says, at about the same time, electronics engineer Tom Jasky was conducting experimentation using a low-power oscillator broadcasting at 300 to 600 megahertz to irradiate subjects. In repeated trials, subjects were able to detect the electromagnetic sweeps. And at these individual frequencies, the same subjects announced having experienced pulsing sensations in the brain, ringing in the ears, and an odd desire to bite the experimenter. Just going to pause for a moment here, folks. 
to bite. <laughs> they felt like they wanted to bite the experimenters. That's great. So you see, frequency can be used to invoke certain behaviors in people. Maybe uh, to cause aggression, to cause irritation. It's not out of the realm of possibility. This stuff's been used before. In fact, I think it's demonstrable that it's been used in many of these ways. Just based upon some of the circumstantial evidence we see. But let's continue reading. As research in mind control progressed, the potential of directly and precisely influencing the human brain with microwaves became apparent. Technologies whereby emotions, messages, and subliminal commands could be beamed directly to the brain of unwitting subjects was researched by both the American and Soviet governments. Among many other projects, the Department of Defense funded work the work of J.F. Schopitz who in 1974 proposed the use of radio broadcasting in conjunction with hypnotic control. Going to pause for a second here, folks. Radio broadcasting in conjunction with hypnotic control. Think about it. <laughs> Think about it. Makes sense, doesn't it? You turn on your television and you have your, your stupid uh, news reporters out there telling you all kinds of things and they're beaming this broadcast signal through the television and it's hitting your brain and it's inducing you into perhaps going into a hypnotic type trance that's one of the secrets of television broadcasting it's a tool that has been known to put the brain into this programming mode it's a known thing it's been known since the development of the technology that it induces that. Let's read on here, though, talking about this radio broadcasting in conjunction with hypnotic control, which was proposed by this Schopitz guy in 1974. In this investigation, Schopitz wrote, it will be shown that the spoken word of the hypnotist may be conveyed by modulate electromagnetic energy directly into the subconscious parts of the human brain, i.e., without employing any technical devices for receiving or transcoding the messages, and without the person exposed to such influence having a chance to control the information input consciously. Going to pause for a moment there, folks. Subliminal messaging. Subliminal messaging bypassing your conscious mind, implanting ideas directly into your subconscious mind, hypnotism. You have to go back and look at the works of Mesmer about hypnotism and stuff like this as well. There's a real science to it. It's not all hokum. Hypnotists, trained hypnotists, can actually sometimes affect human behavior in ways most of the time, the hypnotic subject needs to be needs to consent to the process in order for it to work. But there are ways of bypassing this, as has been shown here, especially when you use it in conjunction with technologies. So that being the case, a lot of the public the, these days is in a hypnotic stupor of sorts. They really literally are. They're in a hypnotic stupor, and they don't know it. And it's hard to snap them out of it. But anyway, let's go ahead. We'll read on here. Because this is more of the context given for this series of experiments. The second experiment was to be the implanting of hypnotic suggestions for simple acts. Like leaving the lab to buy some particular item, which were to be triggered by a suggested time, spoken word, or sight. Subjects were interviewed later, were to be interviewed later. It may be expected that they rationalize their behavior and consider it to be undertaken out of their own free will. The results of Schopitz's experimentation have never been released to the public. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. I don't know if that's still the case. This was as of the time of writing here by Jim Keith. 
So this guy's results in his experiments were never released, at least as of circa 1999-ish. I think that's when this book was written. So you're talking, here we are, 20-some years later, and we probably still don't have this. I'll have to do some follow-up work and see if I could find this guy's original research. Should be interesting to look at. But let's go ahead and read on. In 1978, Dr. Andrew Makrowski wrote that, quote, Potentially, almost anything could be inserted into the target brain-mind systems, and such insertions would be processed by the biosystems as internally generated data or effects. Words, phrases, images, sensations, and emotions could be directly inserted and experienced in the biological targets as internal states, codes, emotions, thoughts, and ideas, end quote. On April 20th, 1976, an apparatus and method for remotely monitoring and altering brain waves was patented. Its inventor was Robert G. Malek of New York. According to the patent abstract, it is an, quote, an apparatus for and method of sensing brain waves at position remote from a subject whereby electromagnetic sim signals of different frequencies are simultaneously transmitted to the brain of the subject, end quote. Although somewhat technical in its jargon, the summary of the invention in the patent bears waiting through for the interested researcher, and it says, quote, The present invention relates to apparatus and a method for monitoring brain waves wherein all components of the apparatus employed are remote from the test subject. More specifically, high-frequency transmitters are operated to radiate electromagnetic energy of different frequencies through antennas, which are capable of scanning the entire brain of the test subject or any desired region thereof. The signals of different frequencies penetrate the skull of the subject and impinge upon the brain where they mix to yield an interference wave modulated by radiation from the brain's natural electrical activity. The modulated interference wave is retransmitted by the brain and received by an antenna at a remote station where it is demodulated and processed to provide a profile of the subject's brain waves. In addition to passively monitoring his brain waves, the subject's neurological processes may be affected by transmitting to his brain through a transmitter compensating signals. The latter signals can be derived from the received and processed brain waves. End quote. That's directly from this 1976 patent. Mind reading technology in 1976, folks. Not only mind reading technology, this technology can be used to transmit information into your brain. 1976, 47 years ago, and we wonder today how it is when you open up Facebook, you wonder how that tailor-made ad pops up there, of that thing that you didn't mention to anybody, you didn't say a word about but you were just thinking to yourself, I need to pick up a such and such thing. And all of a sudden there's an ad on your Facebook feed for that said thing. And you wonder how that works. It's like I said, folks, you'd probably, you'd probably be surprised at just how old many of these things really are. It was possible in 1976 certainly is more possible today, isn't it? And we've also seen stories over the course of the past several years where Facebook was working on mind-reading technology, and they're all working on these mind-reading technologies. It's the world of big data, folks. They can use all of these electronic devices to capture wave patterns, signatures. They're two-way devices. Understand that. Your television said it's a two-way device. 
you don't just watch the television and listen to sounds auditorily coming out of the television and see the images coming on the television. It's a two-way device. Keep that in mind. That's all of these devices. They don't need to put a camera in it. It could all be reversed. They just reverse the process. This has been a known thing in the intelligence community for many years. A television can actually record not only sound from your house, it can actually capture low-resolution, low-level images of sorts. It could be used in that way as well. These devices work two ways, and I know it might, that sounds like a bridge too far for some people, but I assure you that is absolutely true if you go and you look up the science and the development of these technologies. That has always been a possibility to manipulate that, and the intelligence communities have manipulated that, admittedly, in the past. So now think about, with our modern devices... How much more advanced that could be. Think about that and then understand where this is derived from. How long ago that they started developing these technologies. Especially covertly. This is just the stuff that's been declassified that we could find. Imagine what's gone on behind the scenes that we don't know about. And that's the thing. Most people still don't even know about this, even though it's out there in the public literature. You can find it. But I suspect in the near future, things like this will disappear from the record as well. They don't want people to become concerned about these things. They want people to just go get with the program. If you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have anything to worry about, right? Well, now it's gotten to the point where we have these silly devices in our house where you say its name and you could ask it questions. It's always listening to you. They claim they don't listen to you. It only listens for its, its activation word. Well, how does it hear the activation word if it's not listening? <laughs> you have to ask these questions. And this is how far the human mind has fallen in thinking in these ways. So you have these devices in your house that are listening to you 24-7. And it doesn't matter. Even if you have a television in your house, a computer, a cell phone, anything, any electronic device at all, it's always collecting data. They're always collecting data on the backside. Whether you realize it or not. It is a type of recording device. And you don't even need something in your house. I, I mean, there's, there's so much surveillance in place of these technologies. We have time. I'll tell you a little side story here. It's kind of a side trail, but I think it's one that's important just to keep in context here. And you could look this up. I don't remember. It was a couple years back, maybe five, six years ago. We had an incident here around the area where I live where they had this massive military blimp. They were having problems for some reason, and the military blimp descended, and it was dragging this huge, massive cable across the ground in the local area here. I think it was Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, where this thing was came crashing through. Look that up. Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, military blimp. And it was dragging this massive cable, and it was causing damage on the ground and, and downing power lines and stuff like this. And they crash-landed the blimp. And this blimp was a military blimp. And what it was, it was a type of surveillance platform. Well, when this blimp crashed, of course, military intelligence showed up, cordoned off the area, and retrieved it retrieved all the wreckage, and made sure to scurry off any witnesses and get it away from it. And it was revealed in news media that it was a billion-dollar blimp. 
a billion dollar military blimp that had some type of radio frequency devices on it some type of high-tech gear on it for surveillance this is admitted and when I did a little more research into this I found out exactly what kind of equipment it has on it and what this thing was capable of is from very very high up in the sky way up high where you can't see it could actually scan buildings and see every level every layer every floor of a building and map the inside of the building and see everything going on inside the building with this surveillance platform and these are in the skies all over america probably all over the world as well something as simple as a blimp a balloon you might see something up in the sky not know what it is it's a surveillance platform but anyway I don't remember what the ultimate outcome was I know they came they retrieved this it did massive amounts of damage which they wound up paying lots of money for one of the military services if I remember correctly wound up paying for the damage to the community but at any rate this had to be admitted in the public that they have these surveillance platforms because they, they had no way there were too many people that saw this thing come down and realized it was a blimp and they were wondering why was it what, like dragging this massive cable behind it across the landscape and it was interesting and weird because the military showed up and of course it had to come out i mean it was obviously a, a military blimp and apparently it sustained some heavy damage and this thing had a billion dollars worth of equipment in it a billion a billion dollar blimp you see and they have this type of technology on these things and that's just what was publicly available as to what these technologies could be now imagine if it's something that can use frequency in that way to actually map out entire buildings, every floor, even into the basement and underground and see every activity going on and be able to identify every life form in the house and see what people are doing in real time from a mile or more in the air, probably several miles in the air where you can't see it. Imagine what other things they could probably do with these frequencies as we're reading about here and talking about here. So these things exist, and sorry, that was just a side trail, and that's a personal experience. That's a personal thing I've seen happen around here. And of course, they tried to hush the whole thing up. I haven't looked in a long time now to see if you could still find the news articles on that. I'm going to have to go back and look. Maybe I'll do a Substack article about that or some such thing, just to make people more aware of just how much surveillance is going on. And of course, what the nature of probably very many of what we identify as UFOs or UAP, it's probably what they are, it's some type of a surveillance apparatus. That's the most likely explanation for much of the mechanical craft that we see that are identified in that way but like i said that's just a little side story didn't mean to veer too far from the path here but let's get back to it so just imagine if they have that kind of stuff in the air what else can they do with it knowing what we know from what's identified here let's read on though Using electromagnetic broadcasting, Bird says, quote, We could put animals into a stupor by hitting them with these frequencies. We got chick brains in vitro to dump 80% of the natural opioids in their brains. The effects were non-lethal and reversible. You could disable a person temporarily, Bird suggests, that, quote, It would have been like a stun gun, end quote. Bird's program was scheduled for four years, but was closed down after two. Bird believes that it wasn't because the research was unsuccessful, and he says, quote, The work was really outstanding. We would have had a weapon in one year, end quote. 
So we're going to pause for a moment here, folks. So we see that was 1980. They could have had a weapon. And like I said, this is the stuff that's just publicly disclosed now. 1980 to 1983. That's when this one was sponsored. Anyway, let's go ahead. We'll read on here. Bird believes that the work was not discontinued, but was instead simply taken out of his hands and turned into a black project. That statement is hardly outlandish, and numerous other researchers in electromagnetics tell a similar tale of having their work taken away from them at the precise point when they began to get successful results. As conservative a publication as the International Review of the Red Cross in 1990 acknowledged the ascendancy of beam weapons in the field of warfare, the authors of an article titled The Development of New Anti-Personnel Weapons stated, quote, The effects induced in human beings by electromagnetic waves have been known, albeit imperfectly, for a long time and have been the subject of continuous research. Depending on the frequency used, the emission mode, the energy radiated, and the shape and duration of the pulses used, electromagnetic radiation directed against the human body may produce heat and cause serious burns or even changes in the molecular structure of the tissues they reach. Research work in this field has been carried out in almost all industrialized countries, and especially by the great powers, with a view to using these phenomena for anti-material or anti-personnel purposes. Tests have demonstrated that powerful microwave pulses could be used as a weapon in order to put the ad adversary or the combat or even kill him. It is possible today to generate a very powerful microwave pulse, e.g. between 150 and 3,000 megahertz, with an energy level of several hundred of megawatts. Using specially adapted antenna systems, these generators could, in principle, transmit over hundreds of meters sufficient energy to cook a meal. However, it is important to mention that the lethal or incapacitating effects which can be expected from we weapon systems using this technology can be produced with much lower energy levels. Using the principle of magnetic field concentration, which permits the control of the geometry on the target by means of antenna systems especially designed for the purpose, the radiated energy can be concentrated on very small surfaces of the human body. For example, the base of the brain, where relatively low energy can produce lethal effects. End quote. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Directed energy weapons... That's been a popular subject the past week or so, hasn't it? Past couple of weeks. Directed energy weapons also, with the ability to use for behavior modification, all upon the same principles here. Lethal effects, non-lethal effects can be used. It all depends on just how you tune the frequency of the device here. Let's continue on. In 1991, the ITV News Bureau reported on the first known use of electronic subliminals on the battlefield and the true reason for the seemingly illogical and apparently suicidal attack by Iraqi troops on the deserted city of al Khifa, 12 miles south of the Kuwaiti border. According to ITV, the Iraqis had launched a successful attack meant to destroy an FM radio station that had been installed in al Khafiz by the U.S. Department of Defense's PSYOPs branch. Although the station outwardly appeared to be broadcasting Tokyo Rose-style propaganda, deserting Iraqi soldiers claimed that the real purpose of the station was to broadcast the new high-tech type of subliminal messages referred to as ultra-high-frequency silent sounds or silent subliminals. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. So this was during the first Gulf War. 1991. I remember this very well. And I've heard personal stories from people I know who were there. 
who told that this was an absolute fact that the United States military was using these radio transmission devices as mind control weapons, not just propaganda. Went way beyond that. There were subliminals, subliminal messaging being transmitted as well, causing people, Iraqi soldiers, to hallucinate, to hear things, hear voices, see visions. This was in 1991. This type of technology most certainly existed then, and it exists probably at a much more sophisticated level now. So let's go ahead and continue reading here and see what else the author reveals. According to ITV, although completely silent to the human ear, the negative voice messages placed on the tapes alongside the audible programming by PSYOP psychologists were clearly perceived by the subconscious minds of the Iraqi soldiers, and the silent messages completely demoralized them and instilled a perpetual feeling of fear and hopelessness in their minds. In 1993, a method of inducing mental, emotional, and physical states of consciousness, including specific mental activity in human beings, was patented by its inventor, Robert A. Monroe. The now-deceased Monroe was an early practitioner of what is termed remote viewing, or out-of-body travel, and is the founder of the Monroe Institute of Charlottesville, Virginia. He is reported to have had close connections to the CIA. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. Monroe, Robert A. Monroe, the founder of the Monroe Institute, with remote viewing. This is also the guy who's been largely credited with the invention of what's called hemisync technologies that were said to better help people to train to do remote viewing and these type of things. And it's interesting how this stuff crosses over, crosses across the lines of what we would consider our modern science and veers on the mystic. That's so much of what our sciences are about, and it's about the science of consciousness is what it boils down to. And these frequencies have a most definitive effect on our consciousness, in our states of consciousness. So anyway, that's been a known thing. You could look up this Monroe Institute and look up hemisync. It's about syncing frequencies. It's about using frequencies binaural beats of sorts on, on either side of the head to cause certain vibrations to take hold in each of the halves of the brain. And they sync together, and this allows you to fall into an altered state of consciousness wherein you are more readily able to do remote viewing in various things. This is what Monroe developed, and it's an interesting bit of technology, and this goes with the CIA's Stargate program, too. There's a lot of crossover with many of these technologies because of the nature of the radio frequencies and radio waves, the frequencies. So they can be used as weapons, and they do have other uses as well. They could be lethal, they could be non-lethal, and they most definitely can affect human consciousness and human behavior. And that's what we're looking at here. So let's read on and we'll see if we can find out some more here about this. The abstract of Monroe's patent says the, that the specific states of consciousness can be induced through generation of stereo audio signals having specific wave shapes and that in accordance with the invention, human brain waves in the form of EEGs are superimposed upon specific stereo audio signals known as carrier frequencies which are within the range of human hearing. Monroe followed up his initial invention with a method of and apparatus for inducing desired states of consciousness, apparently a new and improved form of his first offering. The U.S. Air Force Review of Biotechnology in 1982 warned that, quote, radio frequency radiation fields may pose powerful and revolutionary anti-personnel military threats. RFR experiments and the increasing understanding of the brain as an electrically mediated organ suggests the serious problem 
probability that impressed electromagnetic fields can be disruptive to purposeful behavior and may be capable of directing and or interrogating such behavior. Further, the passage of approximately 100 milliamperes through the myocardium of the brain. I'm going to pause for a moment here, so folks. It says the myocardium of the brain. I don't know if that's a proper term here, but this is how it's written in the patent. Okay, let's go with it. Through the myocardium of the brain can lead to cardiac standstill and death, again pointing to speed of light weapons effects. A rapidly scanning RFR system could provide an effective stun or ki kill capability over a large area. And then the article continued... There is little doubt that crowd control devices using radio frequency radiation do exist. The development of such devices would complement sonic and infrared weapons, which are well known and were advertised in the British Defense Equipment Catalog until 1983. These included the Valkyrie, an infrared device causing night blindness, and the Squawk Box, or sound curdler, developed by the U.S. for use in Vietnam. The Squawk Box was designed to induce feelings of giddiness and nausea in the victim and is highly directional so that as individuals are hit by the invisible effect, distress and confusion is spread amongst a crowd. In 1984, the Ministry of Defense ordered that all advertisements and references to frequency weapons be cut from the defense catalog. By 1993, the National Institute of Justice and Office of the Justice Department was recommending in its NIJ initiative on less than lethal weapons the state and local police departments in America utilize psychotronic, electromagnetic, and other mind control weapons against American citizens involved in domestic disturbances, a description so broad as to include family arguments. The report said short-term research will be completed to adopt military technologies to use by domestic law enforcement, including, including laser, microwave, and electromagnetic weapons. The Washington Post reported, the Pentagon and the Justice Department have agreed to share state-of-the-art military technology with civilian law enforcement agencies, including exotic non-lethal weapons. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So now we're talking about second-hand use of military-grade weapons, psychotronic weapons for use by civilian police departments. Does that sound like a good idea to you? I don't think it sounds like that great of an idea at all, to be honest, even for militaristic uses. But alas, we do have these technologies. They exist and have been used in the past and will continue to be used. So it does us some good to be aware of their existence, to know that this is not just conspiracy theory or conjecture. These things do exist. They've been tested. They've been tested a lot. Let's put it that way. And the things we're talking about are in a book that's almost 30 years old, acknowledged in this. So let's keep that in mind here. This new approach to law enforcement was showcased in a three-day secret conference on non-lethal weaponry at the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. The conference head was Colonel John B. Alexander, Program Manager for Non-Lethal Psychotronic Defense, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Attending the meeting was Attorney General Janet Reno, military weapons specialists, and representatives from state and local police departments. A wide variety of subjects were covered at the conference, including radio frequency weapons, high-powered microwave technology, acoustic technology, voice synthesis, and application of extreme frequency electromagnetic fields to non-lethal weapons. Going to pause for a moment here, folks, so... This Colonel John B. Alexander, if you've been researching any of these types of things for any length of time, you've probably come across this guy in more than one place, has connections to the whole UFO community and stuff as well. This guy was a real piece of work, <laughs> let's put it that way, and he always had his hands in a lot of this stuff. 
So when you see his name attached to something, you know. You know there's something nefarious going on. But let's continue on and we're going to wrap it up here. The U.S. Air Force has installed high-power microwave generators on air-launched cruise missiles. The stated purpose for the beam generators is to wage computer warfare, frying delicate computer components, but these generators would also theoretically be able to fry the delicate mental components of human beings. Has electromagnetic weaponry ever moved beyond the experimental stage and been used on citizens? Has it ever been utilized in experiments upon an unsuspecting population, the way that drugs and other forms of behavior modifications were used in MK Ultra? Literally thousands of persons worldwide believe that they have. They claim that electronic assault weapons have been used on them, either in for experimentation or possibly for harassment. The sheer number of these accounts, the parallels to what has been verified in terms of the government testing, and the credibility of many of the persons making these claims strongly suggest covert use of these weapons on civilians. One man who believes that he has been irradiated with electronic beam weapons is Martin C. Mack. In an open letter, Mr. Mack describes his experience where he says, quote, I am a former truck driver, now retired. My troubles with what I am about to recount began in the fall of 1987 when I rented a room in Seattle, Washington. The renter next to me had visitors who tried to avoid being seen by me. Comments were made about me describing my actions as if coming from his room. Somehow, they were able to make me hear and also pick up on the process of my hearing, hear what I heard, as if my head, strange as this sounds, was a sort of antenna, and I picked things up, not subliminally, but audibly. They knew when I was coming and going and commented on such. While I was at the hotel, talk was heard about what I was doing. They could account for much of what I did in my room and in the, that building. They must have some way of watching me, I thought. Statements to throw me off as to what they were doing were heard, such as, This stinger will reach 35 feet, and there is a two-way mirror in the lobby. Let us test him, was heard. This was before I moved out, and afterward, he has a microphone in his throat. I do not have a material one there, of course. It was implied that they could pick up on what I voiced. All this seemed like an impossibility. Due to what has transpired over the years, I know these things as fact, regardless of what others might think. One night my spine was made very warm. That region is thermal sensitive and part of the central nervous system. The reflex arc which passes through the spine was triggered and gave my body a jerk. They could heat sting my back shoulder blades. The bone coverings of those are pain sensitive. They decided to drive me out of there and did before the month was up. There is a way that a person can be made selectively receptive to a modulated radio frequency character carrier, and that was resolved while I was there. Before leaving, I inquired as to how long the two previous tenants stayed in the room. A month or two, the manager said, I was not hurt so very badly after they drove me out. Concerning the behavior and mind control, there is not much of a point in stimulating a person unless you could get a visual or audible response from the subject. They do get an audible one from me, a curse for one thing. How I think it is done? An unmodulated radio frequency carrier is sent out from one location, preferably lower in frequency. It passes into the spine and head regions of the subject. The carrier is modulated by the electromagnetic nature of the hearing process, speech, and inner speech of the victim. The fields of the process piggyback on, onto the carrier. It thought that the unwanted fields are filtered out on arrival at the point of reception. If what is received by the offenders displeased them, then a hurtful stimuli is sent out on a carrier to cause pain to the subject, hence behavior and mind control. There is much more to it than that. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So again, we have another testimony from somebody who claims to have been a victim of one of these types of weapons, giving an indication as to the types of things that can be done here. So, we see here, these things have been developed, these types of weapon systems have been developed, and we have 
these people who've made claims as being victims of these weapons. And I don't think we can discount all of these claims because they're very similar. And if you've ever done any research on a subject known as targeted individuals, you tend to find a lot of the same types of things being reported. And it seems very bizarre, but many of the symptoms are common to all of them. And I'm just going to read this last portion here. I skipped over another portion here of somebody else's experience with this, their personal experience. And we're going to get to what's described here as two types of electronic assault. So let's read this, and then we're going to sign off this last portion here. Symptoms of type 1 of these electronic assaults include a bizarre feeling that the right and left halves of the brain are separating with a cap in between, as if parts of the head and face are rearranged spatially, as in a cubist painting. There is an impression of slight puffiness in the face, a flattening of the nose, and definement of features. Type 2 symptoms include the feeling that I could hardly breathe and I felt like I was in an oven. Each breath is like trying to inhale searing desert air, along with the usual headache and severe lassitude, sore, tired eyes, fatigue, hot burning skin, old scars throbbing, and an overwhelming sense of oppression, evil, and helplessness. Further substantiating these claims of electronic assault are the reports of believed victims of mind control harassment who have observed suspect equipment in areas adjacent to where they live. A number of reports of this kind have been compiled by the Association of National Security Alumni in their electronic surveillance project intending to document and expose mind control abuses in the United States. One individual documented by the Electronic Surveillance Project talked to her next-door neighbor who claimed that he was a military intelligence officer employed by a space technology firm and that he was on a year-long temporary duty in the individual's apartment building. It was later determined that the individual was not employed in the military. When the pretended military intelligence officer moved out of the apartment building, the contact went into his apartment and found a microwave oven-sized device and that an excavation had been made in the wall facing her apartment. Another believed victim of mind control harassment looked through the window of her neighbor's apartment to see a one-by-five-foot gray box. A black framed lens projected from the box facing in the direction of her apartment. According to the witness, the box was being operated in some fashion by a man in a three-piece suit who was startled when he realized that he was being observed. And that, friends, is the end of that portion of the book here talking about these frequency-based weapons. So, they've been around a long time. They are definitely a real thing. They have been implemented in many ways, and we have all kinds of testimony from people who claim to be victims of them. And we have some of the scientific facts. We have the patents described here. And they go back a very long time. 1934. The 1930s, electronic mind control devices were being developed. And even as far back as Tesla, prior to those days in the 1930s, these were known commodities. It was known electromagnetic frequencies can affect human consciousness and human behavior in many ways. They've been weaponized through the years. And I would say probably sometime in the 1970s through the 1980s, they were fine-tuned, and now who knows what they look like. I'm sure they're probably a lot smaller. I'm sure, well, I, they probably don't even need to come set up some type of centralized weapon system of sorts like is described in this 1990s era book on this stuff. Probably just send a carrier signal through your computer, through your television, through any number of devices, your cell phone. Anything which can affect you in this way might not even need a device to do it. Like I was talking about the surveillance blimp. 
These things are overhead in the skies. Who knows what kind of capabilities they have. If you have a billion dollars worth of military-grade frequency equipment on board, what can you do with that? Think about that. Just food for thought here, folks. This is way beyond the scope of what people acknowledge. It's not conspiracy theory. It's not tinfoil hat nutter talk. These are real technologies that exist today and are in the hands of some people whom we have no reason to trust. So do you think it's beyond the pale or beyond the scope of possibility that they've used these things in certain ways? And that's just the technological aspect of it. Now, going to the other aspects of the mind control that's been done are the techniques. And we've gone through some of the techniques before. It is a well-honed science at this point, and the electronic portion of it is also a well-honed science as well. So with that being said, we know some certain things. We know these frequency neuro weapons exist and that they are probably beyond what we acknowledge in the public mainstream these days. And we need to be mindful of this. And we've explored the background of this and we're able to see where did they come from, when did they originate, and where do we go from here. Well, I would say you have to just be mindful of the technologies around you, that they can be used and employed should some controlling factor so desire to do so in these certain ways and be weaponized against you. They are dual-use weapons. Dual-use systems, all of these things that have now entered into the public domain for use, they've been put through their paces by the military-industrial complex and have this dual-use aspect to them. So be aware of it. But don't be fearful, folks. Fear is never a state you want to live in. So just be mindful and use this knowledge of the existence of these things to understand what is possible and maybe recognize when something is being implemented here by recognizing the signs, the call signs of all of it. That's the important point here. Anyway, I hope this was informative for you. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you. We'll catch you next time. Have a good night now. Come with me.